Morning, dear friends. When I was a little boy, one of my special heroes was my grandfather. I loved it when he would come to visit. He would always sleep in my bed and I would make a little bed on the floor next to him so that I could sleep close to him. He was big and strong, he told spectacular stories, and he always bought us treats. One of the things that was a little scary about my granddad is that he took upon himself the role of teaching us children the meaning of honor. He called it respect. And one of his favorite sayings was, little boys should be seen and not heard. And if ever he thought we were being disrespectful to our parents, he was quick to correct us. Hides and I have just come back from a time with our grandchildren, and they also seen and not heard, though it's got nothing to do with respect. They're always playing on their iPads and cell phones. In fact, if we can get them to listen to us and talk, we've done really well. Over the next few weeks, we're going to gather around this table and talk about some of the issues of family life in a series called Family Matters. Now, the family that sits around this table is part of a much bigger family that sits around our Heavenly Father's table. We're like a family within a family. And what applies to us here also applies to our church family. But how the world has changed. What does honor mean? What does respect look like? nowadays. Today we are going to discuss honor by looking at the story of Noah and his boys. For not only is honor an important quality in our families both personally and the church, but honor is a quality that God desires and one that attracts him. I trust that you will be blessed as you listen to the message today. Well, good morning. It's good to see you. As you heard, it said we start a new series today entitled Family Matters. And so what we're doing is we're looking at four families of the Bible for the next four weeks on Sunday morning. And we're going to say, God, teach us from these families stuff that's needed for the church family and for ourselves as we live our individual lives. I'm mindful that this morning there are Those here who are grandparents, those here who are children, those here who are married, engaged, some single, some widowed, some divorcee, I I understand we're in various stages of family and uh, share in different aspects of family. But I trust that from these families in the Bible, we uh, glean what God uh, wants for our individual lives. In the evenings... We're doing another series that's running parallel with this one, which we've entitled Four Love Stories of the Bible. So in the morning, we're looking at four families. In the evening, we're looking at four love stories. Let's trust God to work. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, the way your Holy Spirit moves so powerfully amongst us, especially when we gather like this, Lord. We anticipate as we come together that the presence of the Lord is among us. He's yet to convict and to change and to heal. I pray even through the preaching of the word, Lord, there'd be healing of hearts, healing of spirits, and healing of bodies. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and and deal with and convict. In 1 John 1, it says that the, the Holy Spirit convicts us of righteousness, of sin, and of judgment to come. Pray for the convicting power of your Holy Spirit today, Lord God, in Jesus' name, amen. I've been counseling people for a number of decades, and often I will see the situation, some couple will come and they will sit and say, we can't believe why our kids have disrespected us the way we disrespected we." been disrespected. I I often hear people say, I just can't understand it. I think I've done everything right, but everything seems to be going wrong. Things are not good in my life. It is not well with me. I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm praying, I'm reading the Word, and it's just not going well with me. Well, today, I believe that Noah's family takes us to the very heart of that matter, of things going well with you. And There's a spiritual truth we're going to mess with today that 
that hopefully uh, sets us free. Genesis 9, 18. You know the story of Noah? This is after the flood. This is while Noah is trying to build his life, much like you and me. We're looking at our future. We're saying we've got our kids around us. We've got our future ahead of us. We've got work to do. And he had got himself the occupation of a winemaker. He was a farmer. He was farming grapes. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the people of the whole earth were dispersed. Noah began to be a man of the soil, and he planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and lay uncovered, that's a kind way of saying stark naked, in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned backward, and they did not see their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. That is hectic. This old guy, and I'm sure he didn't have a great barber in those days, so he was hairy. He was old. He had seen life. Uh, he gets absolutely blotto drunk. There he is lying stark naked in his tent. The one brother comes and thinks it's hilarious. Runs outside and says, well, you should see what's going on in there. The other two brothers grab a blanket and go shuffling in backwards cover their dad, and sneak out. When he wakes up, and he sees, oh, hang on, where did this blanket come from? He hears the story of what happened, and he is livid with that little brother, the son, the youngest son. Now, you, you ask yourself, now, hasn't Noah a little bit overreacted here? But why does God, that's our opening thought today, why does God say the honoring of a father and mother, which is what was going on there? The two brothers were honoring, covering his nakedness. The other was exposing it, and God makes a big deal of that. In fact, you can find it in the Ten Commandments. Right next to, don't kill anybody, don't steal anybody else's stuff, God says, honor your mom and dad. Fifth commandment. It's the very first commandment that God incentivizes. You know, when he says, don't kill somebody, he just says, don't kill people. But when he says, honor your mom and dad, he says, okay, look, I'm going to incentivize that one. Honor your mom and dad, and then here's the promise. It will go well with you, and you will live a long life. The inverse is implied the whole way through Scripture. Dishonor your mom and dad, and it will not go well with you. And your future is uncertain. It's like someone who's been freed from jail. He's got the, the perfect future lined up in front of him, and he's got these trip wires, these wicked friends, or these things that tie him up, that enslave him with addictions, and his life goes off track. You can be a Christian. Heading for a glorious future. But if you trip over this tripwire, dishonoring mom and dad, it will not go well. You can look at your life and you could say, why am I not getting promoted? You can look at your life, why is the boss doing that to me? You can look at your life and say, why are people disrespecting me like that? Don't they know I'm the boss? Aren't I a righteous man? Aren't I obeying God's word? If you're dishonoring your mom and dad, the Bible says, this is one thing you're going to reap. But, but why does God make such a big thing of it, of the mom and dad thing? 
Well, I think mom and dad's relationship is the closest you have before you get married. It's the one most in your face, and it's the one that's most likely to hurt you. They're that close. They can bless you, and they can hurt you. It's where the rubber hits the road. It's the, it's the interface. It, and in fact, because it's your primary first authority figure in your life, it's a reflection how you're going to handle all authority, including God himself. And God says, we get this one wrong, we're going to get the whole lot of them wrong. As you know, I have uh, three kids. Two of them are grown up now. Uh, one is nearly there. But when they were little, one thing I would never, ever, ever let them get away with was being cheeky to mom, shout at mom, disobey mom, disrespect mom. I'm not a perfect parent. They probably got away with a lot of stuff they shouldn't have. But that one, they didn't. And it was not because that's like righteous indignation that there's injustice in my home. It was the stakes were too high. When they were little, I would get down and look at them in the eyes and say, you cannot behave like that. You cannot let this get into your heart. Because if this gets into your heart, where you treat mom like dirt, where you treat dad like he's worth nothing, if that thing gets into your heart, something will go so fraught that it'll affect your future. That thing needs adjusting. Because this is what happens when you disrespect someone and you dishonor them. Have you heard people say things like this? He's not worthy of my respect. He doesn't deserve my respect. Respect is earned. That might be the case in the world, but it's not a kingdom mindset. It's not the way of the Bible. Because for you to say that they've got to earn it means you've set up a step ladder and there's a certain rung on the ladder when you say, tick, I respect that one. Everybody below there, you disregard, you, you think that their past, and what, you, what we love to do is bring up their past failures and say, you never climbing that ladder. That thing you did keeps you at the bottom. I'm not going to respect you. I'm not going to honor you. And when that happens, something turns in the heart that has a, a contaminating influence on the rest of your life. Some of you sitting here today, as I've started to preach, know there's an issue with your dad or an issue with your mom. I'm not saying you, you're going to have to agree all the time. A and we, obedience is not honor. The Bible doesn't say you've always got to obey your mom and dad. Like you're 56 years old, and your dad says something, you say, yes, I'm going to obey him. It, doesn't, it says honor your mom and dad. You say, God, you don't know my mom and dad. My dad's like Adolf Hitler. If Adolf Hitler had a kid, the fifth commandment applies to that kid. Because God did not put a condition, everybody honor good dads. We all flawed, we all bad. Everybody honor good moms. No, he says, you honor them. And so if you, in your heart, know there's dishonor, disrespect, don't confuse disappointment and pain with dishonor. Some parents can cause you a lot of pain. Some parents can, can cause you an incredible amount of disappointment. But honor is something different to that. Some of you might be sitting there today and say, people have totally dishonored me. I'm feeling dishonored at work. I'm feeling dishonored at home. I trust by the time we finished with this, we'll see the root of it. And the Holy Spirit will be able to get in there. So what is it? What's at the very root of it? Well, the root meaning of the word honor, so the Greek word that's used in your New Testament has a root meaning, and it 
it basically means to ascribe value to something, which is absolutely independent of performance and activities. It's, it's giving it a value. It's far more than the absence of disrespect. It's looking at a human being and say that human being has been created in the image of God. But go on, it's behaving despicably. It's in the image of God. He's not serving God. It's in the image of God. I don't like his behavior. Honor is ascribing value to something. There is a famous bishop. His name was Bishop Curlin, and he said to Mother Teresa one day, now remember Mother Teresa was working in the slums of India. And he said to her, musing one day, oh, I would love to see Jesus. Mother Teresa took the bishop around one of the walls into an alleyway. And there was a man lying on a black leather pallet who had clearly visible things crawling on his body. As the bishop stood there in shock, Mother Teresa knelt down and wrapped her arms around him, holding him like a baby in one's arms. Here he is, she said. Who? asked the bishop. Jesus, said Mother Teresa. Didn't he say that we would find him in the least person on earth? Is this not Jesus challenging us to reach out and love? When Paul was writing to the Corinthians, one of the things that he was telling them to do was to honor the bodies that God had given them. And this is how he put it. He said it in 1 Corinthians uh, 6 verse 19. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Because you were bought with a price, God not only created people, he said the human race is worth coming down to die for. And he ascribes value. What value does he ascribe to you? What value has Jesus ascribed to you? The value of his son. Now what Shem and Japheth did in covering their dad, they demonstrated the heart of Jesus. They demonstrated the gospel. The gospel means the good news of Jesus. This is the good news of Jesus. That he looks at us covered. You, the Bible describes, are wretched, naked, pitiful, blind, and poor, just like Noah. In our humanity, even the best of us, when God looks at us, even the best of us, when, it's, when Jesus is not in the picture, what he would see is nakedness like Noah. But God has chosen to cover that nakedness. And it's something that he spoke about long before Jesus even came. The, Zech the prophet Zechariah says this in Zechariah 3.3. 3. Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed in filthy garments. There's a prophet standing before the angel, stinking like the prodigal son. And the angel says to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I've taken your iniquity, your sin away, and I will clothe you with pure garments. They were speaking about a day. And, and what day was that? that? That day was the day that Jesus would come and represent mankind in man's nakedness. Jesus hung one day naked and said to God, God, here I am, naked. I'm representing mankind, naked. Accept the sin offering. Accept it all on me. 
Don't look at them, look at me. And in that moment, as God accepts that sacrifice, he says, I'll tell you what we're going to do now. We are going to clothe them with garments of righteousness. Like the prophet Zechariah had said, I will clothe them with garments of righteousness. And you say, but God, when we look underneath the garment, it's filthy in there. Exactly. Like dirty old Noah. But what Shem and Japheth did, they covered their dad. It's a picture of how God looks at you. The garments of righteousness that were given to you because of the exchange that happened on the cross of Calvary are resting on you. And when God looks at you, He sees the righteousness of Christ. We are the righteousness of Christ. He said, God, you haven't seen inside. When God looks at you, it's like Noah covered with a blanket. And what happens? He said, but what use is that if I'm still stinky underneath? This is the use. As you are covered in garments of righteousness, you have access to his presence. You have access to his throne room. And you begin a journey where he works that righteousness into you. And you say, well, God, that's going to take a lifetime. Yes, a lifetime. You are sanctified how? By his spirit. What does the Holy Spirit do? It takes the righteousness of Christ, which covers you, and it, it gets it deep into your soul, renews your mind as you work with Christ, and as you avail yourself to him, God sees you acceptable. You don't have to worry about not being acceptable. You can come, dirty, rotten sinner, into his presence. And the more you hang with him, the more that the Holy Spirit sanctifies you through and through. And your, his righteousness becomes part of you. The end of the morning, if you feel that you come before God naked, and, and that your sin is just like overwhelming you. What he's calling you to do today is to accept his son. Accept his son's work on the cross. This is what it says in Romans chapter 10. If you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, in other words, that God accepted the sacrifice, resurrected him from the dead, gave you access to the throne of heaven. If you believe that, and you confess with your mouth that he's your Lord. In other words, you hand your life over to him. Basically, you're saying, I give up. God says, I will save you. I will give you my righteousness. And we will begin a journey. If you need to make that decision today, you'll have an opportunity at the end of this meeting to turn your life over, to, to, to say, God, I, I give up. I need that. But some of you might be saying, Grant, doesn't this go, uh, isn't this going just a little bit too far? Saying you, you have to honor people even if they're bad. Do you know how my boss behaves? G can't I justly say he does not deserve my respect? If you are unsaved, you can say that. But if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, I don't believe that that's your option. You see, it's not, it's not that we're pretending that nothing's wrong. It's not pretending if a Christian says, I'm the righteous of Christ, I'm perfect. I can do no wrong. I cannot sin. You now, there's a word for that. Hypocrite. You are the righteousness of Christ, but you are, you are someone busy being worked on. Honoring someone is not putting your head in the sand pretending everybody's perfect. But, but, but it is a commitment because of the posture of your heart not to broadcast their nakedness. There is a way to deal with issues which is motivated by love, not motivated by a good story. Ham was motivated by a great story. <laughs> you should check what I've just seen. See, when we, when we air the view, 
not only does it contaminate our heart, but it affects other hearts. I've got a son who's sitting in the audience who, who plays cricket. Now, the dads of the cricketers get involved quite, quite emotionally. And so last year, he was playing for a particular team, and most of the dads were around the field. And we all on this WhatsApp group. Uh, and the reason we're on a WhatsApp group is that when a dad can't make it, the other dads are filling in the scores, and you can feel like you're there. So it's pretty cool. So, so we're sitting there this one day, and most of the dads are there. Some moms are not there. And uh, there's this boy who's been batting low down the order and not being much of a chance, and he doesn't bowl, and his dad's been driving a hang of a long way to watch him, and he's been getting hacked off because every week the top order doesn't let him bat. Anyway, on this particular occasion, he got a chance to bat. He happened to be batting with my son. And as it happens in schoolboy cricket, they had this little mix-up in the field, and there was a run-out. But the problem was it wasn't my son who was run out. It was his son. He was fuming. Can you imagine? He's just come to watch his son. He's finally got a knock. And this little redhead has run out his son. So he gets straight onto his phone, and he's going to tell his wife about this. So he says, our boy got a chance today. And he was looking so good. And then that little beep, 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 angry face, cross face, steam coming out of his ears. Redhead has just run him out. But unfortunately, he put it on the wrong chat. <laughs> so now we're all sitting there. We all hear the phones go, ping, 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 ping. <laughs> oh, what somebody said. And their heads all turn. <laughs> like, uh-oh. I just put the thing in my pocket. My wife was very quick. She jumped back onto the phone. He said, oh, I'm terribly sorry. Our son has never been the 100-meter champion. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Trying to defuse it. But you see, gossip and broadcasting doesn't only contaminate this. It contaminates other things. And you know, the Bible gives us a way in honor to handle a brother that sins. When we see the dirt inside, it doesn't mean we accept hypocrisy and just say there's perfection there. When we're looking at him, he's accepted because Jesus has accepted him. But, but when there's an issue that needs to be dealt with, this is what it says in Galatians, Paul writes to the Galatians, brothers, if anyone is caught in a sin or a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. Another reason to honor people is as you approach them, you realize you are not perfect. Doesn't Jesus give us an amazing way to handle it in Matthew 18 when he says, just go one-on-one -on -one to the guy. Why? Because we don't really want to broadcast this on CNN. The way to honor him is to look him in the eye. Because you see, honor doesn't mean you have to agree with him. Honor doesn't mean that you have to obey him. It means you give him value. You respect him as a human being created in the image of God. And you look at him. If he does not listen to you, and his heart is fraught, still don't broadcast it to CNN. Bring a brother. What are you doing? You're honoring him as you're resolving him. If that doesn't work, you still don't broadcast it to the whole planet. You go to the church. In this instance, get the, get the elders involved who, who are able to sit and talk it through. As we draw this to a close, some of you might be saying, Grant, can't this be misused? This teaching of honoring people, so they, you know, they, I know you're saying you can correct someone, but really, just honoring everybody? Teaching that, can't it be misused? Can't I be abused? Won't people walk all over me? Well, I think 
this teaching on honor is misused. And one of the fir- I'm going to give you three times where I think it's misused. And I think that the first one is actually in churches. Have you heard this teaching? Do not touch the Lord's. You see, some of you have heard that teaching. You haven't heard it from this pulpit, but you've heard it. That comes out of the story of David and Saul, where Saul was hunting David down, and David had many opportunities to kill him, but he preferred not to harm him, saying to his followers, I I know I could have taken his head off when he went to the toilet, because I was hiding in the toilet, and I know I could have taken him out when he was fast asleep, snoring like a pig. I know I could have, but I don't want to touch the Lord's anointed. And so in some religious stroke spiritual circles, they almost make the pastor untouchable. I'll tell you why that is not only wrong, I think it's demonic. Because honor is nothing that can be demanded. It's given. It's like love. Because it comes from the heart. Imagine two people falling, you know, they start dating. Or they, they see each other. Let's put it that way. They, they've encountered each other. The bloke falls head over heels in love with her. But after a date or two, she says, I do not like this guy. And he decides now, He is going to force her to love him. We have a name for that. There's some psychological classification, some psychopathical (laughs) classification due to a guy like that. You cannot force a woman to love you because, because love is freely given. It comes from the heart. If you try and climb it out, I'm ordering you to love me. We, we know that that's wrong, don't we? We know it's weird. The same applies to honor. You, you can't climb into someone's heart and order them to honor you. That's abuse. If you're in a situation like that and someone's demanding that you honor them, there's something wrong with that. You say, oh God, well, how did you do it to your kids? When I look my kids in the eye, it was not motivated because like I'm some e- egomaniac that I want my little three-year-olds to bow down and worship me. When I'm looking at them, I know it's for their good. I can't let this rot get into their heart. It's an issue of honoring God, of honoring people. But when it is imposed upon people, it can go warped. Another way is that when we have selective honor. I touched on this in the beginning. I love this scripture. While Peter was addressing his letter to us. Now remember, Peter had had friends beheaded. He was living in an environment when the emperor was an oppressive regime. Slavery was ensconced. And the emperor certainly was not God-fearing. This is what Peter says. Honor everybody. This is in 1 Peter 2, 17. Honor everybody. Some of your translations will say respect, but it's the same Greek word as honor. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Love the church. Fear God. And honor the emperor. Isn't that amazing? Honor everybody. Love his church. Fear God. And honor the emperor. He's pretty much given us zero option to dishonor anyone from the emperor, even if you disagree with him. There's probably about 20 million Americans who are taking pot shots at their emperor right now. And he's got this fancy hairdo, so he's easy to spot. <laughs> honor the emperor. You don't have to agree with him. And honor everybody. What do you mean, my boss? Everybody. My sadistic dad? Everybody. And when we stop putting scales 
and saying, honor for some, not honor for others. It's misused. And then finally, and this gets to the very heart of it, because you might be asking the question, well, Grant, how? How do I, if I find myself dishonoring people, how do I, how do I fix it? Well, it gets to this point, friends. It's the issues at the heart. Remember when John, the baptizer, had to face his disciples, and his disciples says, we don't like this because Jesus and his disciples are baptizing more people than we are. What did John say to him? He said, there's something wrong here, my little disciples. He needs to increase. We need to decrease. If there is any scale, it's we honor God with everything, and because we honor God, we honor everybody else. When Jesus was talking to the Pharisees, this is what he said in Mark 7. He said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, and the teachings are merely human rules. He says, there is a type of people who get up and they say the right thing. But honor isn't coming from the heart. God looks at it and he says, your teachings are in vain and your worship is useless. Why? Because honor comes from the heart. Honor everybody. Love the church. Fear God. That's where it comes from. God who gave you that father and mother. God who gave you your life. God who rescued you and gave value to everybody else. Fear him. And when honor comes from the heart, out of the heart the mouth speaks. And then God says, that's honor. Let's stand to our feet together, please. One of the band could come forward. If you're visiting here today, on occasion when I'm finished preaching here or the preacher is finished preaching here, he has to nip across town to one of our later services. I'm on my way there now, so I'm sorry I won't be able to wait and chat to you, but there's a team of pastors here who are leading this meeting right now. I've come in to preach, but they're leading this meeting. Under the government of the Holy Spirit, not some pastor. God's busy working. I believe some of you are feeling dishonored by your kids. A lot of pain there. Some of you might be feeling right now that you have dishonored maybe your parents, maybe people close by to you. It's an issue of the heart there. And I'm certain that the Holy Spirit is going to work on your hearts right now. There's some of you need to repent. Some of you just need to put your hearts before God and say, God, this is my heart. Do some surgery on this thing. I confess that I'm needing you. Remember, one John it says he convicts us of sin of righteousness of judgment to come but I would like just briefly to talk to those who I spoke to earlier when I said you might feel if you're standing here spiritually naked with all your sin hanging out and you know that you've got to give up this morning give your life over to Christ and this is what salvation is is that God covers you and he says we can start from this point you didn't do anything, my boy or my girl. Jesus did it. Accept him. Just give up. Accept him. And his righteousness gets accredited to you. And you can come. We can begin this journey. So if you need to make that step this morning, we have been praying for you all week. It's a Tuesday prayer meeting here that prays for people who need to make that step. I want to ask you to put your hand up so I can pray with you. I'm not going to call you forward, but I'm going to ask you to put your hand up. In a few moments, I'm going to say, shoot your hand up to heaven and say, God, I need you. I need to surrender right now. I need to surrender and have your righteousness imparted to me. Well done. Raise your hand down again as you've raised it. I went on a walk this morning. 
was calling out to God saying, if there's anybody in this building that needs to surrender today, Lord Jesus, give them the courage. Well done. You can put your hand down. Well done. Well done. Well done. You can put your hand down there. I'm going to wait a little longer because there, this is not worth messing with. You don't need to go out of here again thinking, man, the spiritual thing, I'm going to get it right. You can't get it right. You're a mess, man. You need to be covered by the righteousness of Jesus. Is there anybody else? Just wave at me. Well done. Well done. Well done. This side. That was worth it. Just a little wait for me. You're not raising your hand to me. You're raising it to heaven. You're saying, God, here I am. What we're going to do is we're going to pray a prayer now. Well done. And as we pray this prayer, God is faithful to his word. God is not a man like us that he should lie. He is faithful to his word. When he says, you give up, you surrender, you give your life to me, you believe in me, he says, I will cover you with righteousness. I don't feel like I'm righteous. I will cover you with righteousness. You can come into my presence. I will save you is what he says. Pray this prayer with me. Those who've raised their hands together, the rest of you, please lift up your voices and pray for them as they pray. Pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God, that you died and rose again, and that God the Father finds you acceptable and your sacrifice acceptable. I don't understand it, but I believe that you offer me forgiveness and righteousness, and I accept that this morning, and I declare that you are my Lord and I stand on your word and I ask you to save me from this moment cover me with righteousness bring me into your family in Jesus name Amen the Bible says heaven's rejoicing let's rejoice for those who have got saved Listen, friends, one of the most important things for you to understand, those who prayed that prayer, this is the beginning, not the end. This is not like fire insurance and that you just forget Jesus. You give access to his presence. He wants to start working on you. We would love to put something in your hand to get you going with this journey. And the most honorable way I can think right now, we will do other ways at other times, is to invite you to go to the back. Can you pass me that thing? Yeah, Brett put a little pack together. It's a red pack. There's a little blimp at the back in the foyer. While everyone's having tea and coffee, just walk up to it and say, can I have one of those red packs, please? Just live in your Bible and go and start reading it tonight. We want to see you strong in your faith. And so just go to the back, that little red blimp, say, give me my red pack, please. And uh, thank you for coming. We're going to worship. I'm going to hand this meeting back over to these pastors. I don't think God has finished dealing with you, especially if there's issues with people in your heart. As we worship, as we sing this song, allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you.